Welcome to the Sui Generous Show, your unique perspective on everything you need to know about your civil rights and the criminal injustice system. With Erica Merrill, I'm attorney Brian Jones, criminal defense and civil rights warrior. Today in segment one, we'll be catching up with the latest news on the investigation into the murder of Casey Goodson in Columbus, Ohio. And we'll be discussing the wrongful home entry and handcuffing of a woman in Chicago, Illinois. In segment two, as promised, we will get updated on the state of sealing records and expungement law in Ohio. And we're looking forward to a new year and new eligibility for citizens around the state. To make sure you don't miss an episode, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And follow us on all of our social media channels. Look to the law office of BrianJones.com for everything you need to know about your civil rights and the criminal injustice system. So Erica, did you see in the news this week, there were a bunch of updates in the investigation of the murder of Casey Goodson by Franklin County Sheriff's Office Deputy Jason Mead. Yes, I did. And that incredibly surprising story that we just talked about seems to really be unfolding more and more. Yeah, so records revealed that Deputy Jason Mead was the subject of multiple internal investigations including a 2017 shooting of another citizen after he exited an unmarked vehicle while in plain clothes, the fatal shooting of a separate citizen in 2018, and alarmingly, his internal investigation red flag of no inmate contact status, which was put on him in 2007, for which Franklin County Sheriff's Office destroyed its records. I mean, all of that is just horrifying. Uh, let's start with like, shouldn't an officer who was involved in multiple shootings so close together be reviewed for fitness? Well, absolutely, Erica. Remember that officer involved shootings are a statistically rare occurrence within a law enforcement division. So any officer that's involved in multiple shootings any officer that shot and killed multiple people should not only be investigated for the property of their actions, the appropriateness of their actions in, in that particular shooting, but they should be subjected to a psychological exam. They should get additional training. They should receive support services. There is no record Jason Mead received any additional training. There is no record that Jason Mead ever had a psych evaluation in response to his multiple violent actions on the people of Central Ohio. And the other interesting thing that you mentioned was a no contact for inmates. What is that? I have not heard of that before, but it doesn't sound good. So in Jason Mead's case, it means that he could not have any physical contact with a person in the custody of the Franklin County Sheriff's Department jail. Now, such a restriction could be put in place when an officer is accused or investigated for the mistreatment of an inmate, whether that's physical, like, like physical abuse, assault, emotional, like verbal, or denial of visitations, or denial of medication and, and medical needs, um, services abuse, like denial of food, blankets, um, you know, um, bedding, or even sexual abuse. So the fact that Jason Mead was kept on this status for four years indicates that whatever he was investigated for, and we'll never know unless somebody comes forward and is honest about it, was found to be sufficiently substantiated through their internal investigation process to slap him with a four-year ban from working at the Franklin County Jail. Now, Conveniently, the Franklin County Sheriff's Office has a record retention policy of four years and destroys all the files related to discipline after that very short period of time, that inappropriately short period of time. And this is despite the fact that there is no statute of limitations on murder and felonious assault has a six-year statute of limitations. This is one more example, Erica, of why law enforcement reform must include personnel and record retention policies and not just policing and use of force protocols. 
No, I agree with you. I mean, it sounds like the policies absolutely need to change to protect everyone involved. So the other big thing in this case, Erica, is that the Second Amendment Rights Group Buckeye Firearms Association has thrown its weight behind Casey Goodson and is calling for answers in the shooting of a lawfully licensed carry conceal permit holder. Did you see this update? Yeah, I mean, I was really surprised. I mean, it seems like that would be quite unusual. I mean, it's a Second Amendment rights group. Do they typically get involved with a police shooting controversy like that? So they typically don't. The, the cross-section between 2A people and supporters of law enforcement, you know, that Venn diagram is practically a circle. Um, and historically, groups like the Buckeye Firearms Association and the NRA don't want to come out in support of victims of police brutality. This case is unique given the inadequate and frankly suspicious response of the police agencies that were on the scene in the moments after the shooting of Casey Goodson. So I think Buckeye Firearms is really looking at this and saying, gosh, this could have been any one of our members. And it doesn't matter if he's white or black, wealthy or poor. This is a, this is a Second Amendment issue to its core. So I'm just, I'm totally shocked too. Um, why is the Buckeye Firearms Association involving itself in Casey Goodson's story? So Casey was a licensed carry conceal weapons holder. So he's just like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Ohioans. Now the police are claiming that Casey Goodson was waving his gun in the air. Now, most importantly, this isn't a crime. And no citizen should ever be shot for it, whether they're white, black, or otherwise. Now, the police are also claiming that Casey Goodson aimed the gun at law enforcement who was on the scene. Yet the FBI task force that Jason Mead was working with expressly denied that they were involved in Jason Mead's behavior. And they've asserted that their police action was concluded before Jason Mead decided to follow Casey Goodson to his home and shoot him in the back. These facts are critically important. You cannot be shot for carrying a firearm in your pocket. You can't be shot for carrying a firearm in your holster. You can't be shot for carrying a firearm at your side. You can't be shot anywhere for, you can't be shot for carrying a firearm, period, if you hold a carry conceal weapon license. Buckeye Firearms is demanding accountability for the shooting of this citizen who is validly and appropriately exercising his Second Amendment rights. And honestly, I applaud them for doing it, especially with Chad Bouse's feelings that the shooting brings to light a lot of questions surrounding the right to legally carry a gun and a person's, a person's skin. Really, really proud of Buckeye Firearms for their allyship on this. So it was obviously a situation where Second Amendment rights were encroached upon and they are going to make sure that justice is done. And I think that's fantastic. Absolutely. So the other big thing in the news that happened with the criminal injustice system and repeated violations of civil rights across our nation was the stunning reveal of body cam footage of police in Chicago handcuffing an innocent, naked social worker during a raid on the wrong house. Did you see this in the news this week, Erica? This is maybe one of the most horrifying things. I mean, it's pretty bad with the whole Breonna Taylor situation, just getting shot in your bed. But here's a situation where someone is alive, getting handcuffed while they're naked, telling the police over and over again that they have the wrong house. And I don't know why anybody didn't check the address. February 21st of 2019, nine police body cameras were rolling when a group of male officers broke down the front door of Annette Young. She's a social worker who had just returned from work and was in the process of changing from her work to her home clothes. The officers kicked in her front door, screaming warrant, get your hands up, and probably a variety of other profanities. And Miss Young was terrified and confused as anybody would be in that situation. She immediately started telling the officers, you've got the wrong house, I live here alone. An officer grabbed her, put her hands behind her back 
and handcuffed her in the nude. She was left there nude and handcuffed in front of all nine male officers, guns and lights in her face, inspecting her body for 13 minutes before another female officer ultimately arrived on scene and allowed her to get changed. She was then immediately re-handcuffed and held while the officers figured out that they had screwed up and raided the wrong location. Their apology was an offer to replace her door as they were leaving. That's just absolutely infuriating. And that the situation is dire. And I'd love to know, you know, what your thoughts are on why you think that it took so long for them to release the tapes to Mrs. Young. So this is a problem that we run into all the time. And it's always a big red flag for me. The longer it takes for a public agency to respond to my FOIA Sunshine Law request, it, it indicates to me that they've got something to hide. And the Chicago Police Department and Mayor Lori Lightfoot fought this woman every step of the way. Ms. Young ultimately had to file a federal civil rights lawsuit, litigate discovery, and receive a federal court order before the Chicago Police Department produced the video. I should say, Mayor Lightfoot did issue an apology about a year after the fact to Ms. Young for the Chicago Police Department's actions and for her own in trying to prevent the video from being released, um, both to Ms. Young and to the media. So how did the Chicago PD make that mistake? So the body cam footage reveals that the police officers that were on scene questioned the issue of issuance of the warrant from the very beginning. This is probably another reason why the city brought, uh, tried to bury the tape. Now in this particular case, the Chicago Police Department received a tip from an informant and they failed to do anything to vet the tip. So basically some snitch went to the Chicago Police Department and said a, a felon is living at Miss Young's address and she's in possession of a firearm. Now remember, she's a social worker. So there's probably a significant number of people out in the world that have uh, an ax to grind and a reason to make this happen to her. And the Chicago Police Department did absolutely nothing to check on the veracity, the truthfulness of this tip. They didn't do any surveillance. They didn't do any investigation. It doesn't even look like they did anything to look into Ms. Young's background. This sounds so much like what happened to Breonna Taylor and resulted in her murder. The tiniest bit of investigation would have revealed that their target actually lived next door to Ms. Young and further that Ms. Young had lived in the residence alone for over four years, that she was a city employee, that she was a licensed social worker who had passed multiple extensive background checks to secure her employment. Just the tiniest bit of investigation would have revealed all of this information and prevented all of this from happening. You know, not the least of which, granting her the opportunity, even while watching her, to put on a pair of pants before they cuffed her and inspected her body nude. I mean, to me, social workers are angels. You know, they have a very difficult job and they don't typically make a lot of money. And this just, this kind of aggravation and just really traumatic experience is unexcusable. So, isn't I look? I have a question about the media because now they're playing these tapes. I mean, do you think that that is compounding the trauma to Miss Young by playing this video over and over again on the news? Well, the media is doing it with her consent. She fought for the release of this video. She wants the world to see the forty-three times she told the officers that they had the wrong address. She wants to see the world to see over and over again, them ignoring the evidence that was standing right in front of their bare eyes. And she wants to be an advocate for her change. And I applaud her for that. 
In her words, if the police don't make sure they have the correct address before conducting the search warrants, their actions will continue to traumatize innocent families. We've seen this over and over and over again. And the stories that get national attention are the stories that result in something like this or something that happens like what happened with Breonna Taylor where somebody has to die. How many more American citizens, how many children have to die before law enforcement is held accountable for their mistakes, before they're told you're not allowed to make these mistakes when you're dealing with people's lives? They can't just callously do this and leave people in ruins because they made a clerical mistake. Now, I echo Ms. Young's sentiment, and I know that despite the trauma that she suffered, she is well represented and on her way to having her rights vindicated, while folks like Brianna Taylor will never get that opportunity. Yeah, and that is the sad truth. And so I'm glad that she's well represented. And I'm glad that she's advocating to shine a light on this situation. And we're continuing to fight to make sure that there are changes in how things are done within the police departments and make sure that people are protected and that they're just checking their facts so that this doesn't happen to more innocent people. So bravo to her. Absolutely. And, you know, we acknowledge that people make mistakes. The key to making it right is just that. You have to make it right. You have to change your behavior. And what we see in law enforcement is they blame everybody else. They blame the citizens and they put, they put the onus back on the people and say, it's your fault that we're doing this to you. And so they don't deserve a second chance until they get it right the first time. But a lot of people do deserve a second chance. And the way that they get that second chance is through expungement and sealing their records. Now, people often use those terms interchangeably, expungement and sealing of records. But in the state of Ohio, there are two very distinct and separate opportunities that are defined by law. And with the new year coming in, it brings in new eligibility and new opportunities for people to clean up the mistakes of their past. So let's, in segment two, jump in and check up on the state of the laws in Ohio on sealing records and expungement. So, yeah, that is interesting because it does seem like they would be interchangeable. What is the difference between the two? So expungement means to destroy, delete, or erase a record so that it's permanently irretrievable. It, it can never be found again. Expungement is currently only available to a victim of human trafficking. Now, sealing of a record is a court order to seal the record of DNA, fingerprints, and case proceedings from the general public and from commercial background check services. So sealed records are not destroyed, they exist, but there's in, in many courthouses, there's literally a piece of tape, a seal that is put over the file that can only be broken under very specific conditions and by very specific entities. Who would have access to a sealed record? So law enforcement can access sealed records for the purposes of investigation. Prosecutors can also access those sealed records for the purposes of investigation and determining the appropriateness of a particular charge. Parole and probation officers can access them, again, for the purpose of investigating their probationers and parolees. Um, the named person of the sealed record, the person whose record is sealed, can ask to review the sealed record themselves. Uh, the police officer who was involved in the sealed case can access those records for their own defense in a civil action uh, if they're sued by the person whose record is sealed. Um, the police can also access those records, including the Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections and the Department of Youth Services, the prison system and the juvenile prison system for the purposes of conducting a background check for people who want to work in their facilities or visit their facilities. Um, the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Identification can access those again for reporting purposes and background checks. Sheriff's departments and particular deputies can do it for background checks as well. The state attorney general's office can access them for sex offender classification. 
um, a court, the registrar of motor vehicles or prosecutors for assessing the number of appropriate points on a, a person's driver's license. Um, prosecutors can access them in a criminal proceeding in order to impeach a defendant. And that means challenge their credibility based on that prior conviction. Um, and the Board of Education is a jurisdiction that's entitled to keep the record on file um, when they're considering a permanent expulsion. So even if you have your criminal record sealed, there's no power to force like the Board of Education or other administrative agencies from sealing those records. So there's a variety of ways that those records can be sealed. And it really boils down to there's a particularized law enforcement need or the person whose record sealed is authorizing access for that record for the purposes of a background check. Now, in the past, you and I have spoken on numerous occasions on you know, how this can affect your life, how certain records being public can affect your life. And as you just said, like one of the things is, um, you know, when people are doing checks for background checks for a job and I think part of it is that like a lot of people don't think it's going to affect their life. So they don't go through the hassle of seeing if they can get their records sealed. And I know that you help your clients all the time. And I do You just want to say to everyone watching out there, if you know somebody who may have a question on something like this, so another criminal matter that they might have a question on, you know, please feel free to give the Office of Brian Jones a call because he and his staff are just up on all of the latest when it comes to criminal justice. And they are fantastic with their strategy and getting great results for their clients. So with that being said, what kinds of records can be sealed? Yeah, so in particular, when we're talking about the, the records themselves that can be sealed, what we're talking about are the fingerprint records and the DNA records, the case documents, um, the police reports, those sorts of things can all be sealed according to court order. Now, generally speaking, most attorneys miss a lot of this information because the prevailing party, the, the person that wins, the person that succeeds in getting their record sealed or ordered to be sealed by the court, often has to draft the entry that, that orders these documents to be sealed. And it's critical that you make sure that fingerprint records are expressly stated in the order sealing the records. It has to say it clearly in there. You can't just say the case is sealed. It's got to expressly say fingerprint records and it has to be made applicable to the agency that collected the records. Likewise with the DNA records, the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Identification has to receive a copy of that entry. Ohio BCI has to be specifically ordered in the appropriate way to seal those DNA records. Now the case documents, obviously they're in the courthouse, the court has jurisdiction over itself, but the records of the police reports, those have to be specifically requested. Um, and of course, you know, when we're talking about either a conviction or in many cases, uh, a finding of not guilty or a dismissal, both of those can be sealed. I mean, and that's great to know. Now, I've, I've mentioned that it would help, but I'd love for you to tell us how sealing a record will help the average person. So for employment purposes, I mean, obviously you've got background checks, licenses, promotions, you know, all the sorts of things that come with, um, you know, when, you, when you're changing jobs and you're trying to get a new job, um, publicity, you know, these records are, are public information. So running for office or even becoming a public figure by going so far as to, to coach your child's sports team. You know, people are going to see that you're that coach and they may start trying to do background checks on you. You know, simple privacy reasons. Um, we all know that Karen that lives in our neighborhood and puts her nose in everybody's business. Well, those records are currently on the court docket and available publicly right now. And maybe the most important reason, Erica, that people want to have their records sealed is the personal satisfaction and knowledge that the mistake that they made in the past has been remedied. It's been, they've paid their restitution, they've been rehabilitated to the standard of society. And, you know, vindication for wrongfully filed charges that resulted in acquittal, um, or were completely dismissed. 
You know, it's, it's not fair to people that, you know, they've been arrested, they've had their name drugged through the mud, um, you know, and they still have to have this record following them all over the place. Uh, so this is an opportunity to kind of correct those wrongs, even in some small way. Well, that makes sense. And, you know, I'm really glad that you are there for your clients and able to advise them on what is going to make sense and what is going to help them get further in life, you know, if they've, if they've had a situation that needs to be sealed. I can't hear you. Three, two, one, absolutely. And it's so important to have that clean record moving forward because you know, going through probation is difficult. And by the time you get done with it and you've lived a clean life for the statutorily appropriate period of time, you deserve that clean, you deserve that clean slate. And for the people that were found not guilty or had their charges dismissed, that slate never should have been dirtied in the first place. And so erasing those lies about you from the public record is critically important. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to us today. And Erica, thank you, of course, for joining me once again. To become informed about the hottest topics in the criminal injustice system, holding police and the government accountable for the wrongs that they've committed against us, and sealing your criminal history, check out the law office of BrianJones.com or find us on our social media, facebook.com slash Central Ohio Criminal Defense. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at T-L-O-B-J. And you can find a lot of our information using the hashtags no walk, no talk, and no blow. We'll be back next week with a sui generis perspective on the next big thing in your civil rights and the criminal injustice system, as well as an explanation of those who are and are not eligible for sealing records in the state of Ohio. Erica, my grandfather always told me, don't do anything I wouldn't do. And to that, when I part ways with my friends, I add, if you do and you get caught, call me. I'll defend your rights as I'd want mine defended.